Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Welcome to the 630th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, then you've probably heard me talk about our Edible Backyard Summit. It's a three-day online food-growing inspiration and education event that brings together thousands of people to learn practical tools for living healthy, self-sufficient lifestyles and growing your own food. If you enjoy the Urban Farm Podcast, then I can pretty much guarantee that you're going to love the Edible Backyard Summit. It's just like the podcast because it's free and you'll learn a lot from experts in their fields. And unlike the podcast, you'll get to see the presentations on your screen and have your questions answered live. The upcoming Edible Backyard Summit airs live September 14th through the 16th with informative presentations that food growers of all kinds will enjoy, whether you are an aspiring newbie or a seasoned expert. And whether you live in an apartment or have acres to grow on. And for this upcoming summit, we're going to do something a little bit different and special. The September 2021 Edible Backyard Summit is best of themed, meaning that we're going to be showing listener favorite presentations from the last two years. These are the cream of the crop presentations that people couldn't get enough of. And this is the only time and place you can watch them for free. You'll learn about some of the best plants to use in an edible landscape, regenerative composting techniques, patio farming for small spaces, how to build healthy soil that makes your plants grow like crazy, an ergonomic straw bale gardening technique, and lots more. To sign up for free, head over to ediblebackyardsummit.com. And if you have friends and family that love to garden, please invite them too. This is a great opportunity to do something fun virtually with other food growers in your life. If you're ready for some fall gardening inspiration for your most vibrant, healthy, and self-reliant life, I invite you to join me for the Edible Backyard Summit. Sign up at ediblebackyardsummit.com and get ready to create the edible yard of your dreams. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Greg Peterson coming to you from the urban farm in the heart of Phoenix, Arizona. I'm here with Miss Janice tonight. Hello, Janice. Hello, Greg. I'm Janice Norton. I am at Two Peace in a Pod. I'm in the northern end of the Phoenix Valley, a little bit away from Greg. Cool, cool. Well, thank you for being here. Of course. Where else do I might? There you go. <laughs> And I am very excited. We have a rock star on with us tonight, a gardening rock star. Take a deep breath, Nikki. Um, <laughs> Nikki Jabor. And I guess let's just jump in. Don't let limited space intimidating, intimidate your growing style. It doesn't matter if your plants are on patios or balconies, kitchen counters or windowsills, a driveway corner or just outside your front door. If you have a little patch of light and space for a pot or three, then you can grow food. Tonight on the Urban Farm Garden Chat, we're going to cover small space, big potential with our friend Nikki Jabor and discuss how to make the most out of the little spaces around us for growing vegetables and even some fruits. Nikki is the author of four books on food gardening, including Year-Round Vegetable Gardener and Growing Undercover. She's also a two-time winner of the prestigious American Horticulture Society Book Award. Congratulations. That's awesome. Nikki writes for newspapers and magazines and has hosted a weekly radio show for the past 14 years. You can find her at SavvyGardening.com. Welcome to the Urban Farm Garden Chat. Nikki, how are you tonight? I'm great. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thank you for inviting me. It's so exciting to chat with you again. Right. Yeah. You were on our podcast maybe three months ago when we got to meet you the first time. So thanks for being here. Yeah. Um, So fun. I'm so excited. (laughs) Well, you know, the truth is we could probably go on for three hours, but we have about 45 minutes. So. All right. Well, and the other thing, the other interesting thing for you is you are in a time zone that I had (laughs) never heard of. Oh, until so th- this is a this is a really good educational piece i want you to share just real quickly what time zone are you in and where are you at i am in atlantic time which is uh in halifax nova scotia which is if you're in new york city about 12 hours north if you're driving wow. so i'm on the eastern part of canada a province that's pretty much almost an island so that's where i am 
There you go. And it's only 70 outside right now. Oh. Just came in from the garden. It's amazing. Perfect temperature for gardening. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> nice. when, when I came yeah. in from the truck a little while ago, it was 106 degrees. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's, that's hot. That's hot. <laughs> that that's is hot. hot. So yeah. it's called Atlantic time, and it's a, an hour behind East Coast time. An hour ahead. So here it's nine. It's after 9 o'clock at night now. Oh. Eastern time would be 8. You know, Pacific time oh, would be yes. uh, seven, five. Oh, five. Yep. Yeah, five, you're right. Yeah. It is five o'clock. Yep, exactly. And I think it's six o'clock where you are, isn't it? No, we're, we're, we do something funny. We don't, we don't follow those rules here in Arizona. It's the wild west, baby. All right. Yeah. We, right. we, go, we go with whatever we, th- anyways. <laughs> so we you've written. Stay written mountain a- standard. That's it. Just, we just stay in mountain standard. We don't bother with the change. Yeah. It makes them so much easier. There you go. <laughs> so you've written Before some. Before we get bo- into that. Go ahead. Before we get into that, can I do my business? Hey, everybody. I just want to let you know that I'm going to be stepping off here a little bit to let Greg and Nikki chat. But I wanted to make sure that you all had a chance to know how our system works. If you're in this live event, what you need to do is you need to put your questions in the Q&A. And we'll bring those up as much as we can. Some we'll have to answer off if we end up getting a lot of questions. You can chat in the chat room. Be sure to tell us where you're located in both Q&A and in the chat. And this is going to be released later as a podcast, so you'll be able to catch answers. If you miss them, you don't have to worry too hard about taking notes. Just sit back and enjoy. Awesome. Thank you, Miss Janice. Thanks, everybody. All right. So I I just want to jump in first and talk about year-round vegetable gardening in Nova Scotia. (laughs) Yeah, totally. I mean, that is something I've been doing for over two decades. You know, wintertime, you go up to my garden, we might have a foot or two of snow, Mm -hmm. but there is probably about 30 different types of vegetables we harvest from our unheated structures, cold frames, mini hoop tunnels, I have a poly tunnel, and even some beds are just deep mulch with, you know, fall leaves that we've raked in the autumn. So there's quite a variety that we have, root crops, salad greens, stem crops, uh, like leeks. So, you know, at first I didn't think anybody would be interested in the crazy way that I harvest in winter, but then I wrote the year on vegetable gardener and it sold over 120,000 copies. So luckily there's lots of kindred spheres out there that also are crazy for cold frame. Right. (laughs) Congratulations. That's awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you bet. So you mentioned leaf litter for mulch. Um, yeah. So you said it. So I want to call you on it. Tell us a little bit about that, because it is one of the best mulches we can use. Right. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, how in autumn, a lot of people, if they have fallen leaves, maple leaves, birch leaves, what have you, they rake them up and put them on the curb for the right. municipality to pick them up. Well, hold I on. mean, that hold stuff on. is. Do you go collect it? I'm a leaf thief. <laughs> ah, there you go. I love I that. Have, I am I also a trailer. A leaf thief. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I fill up my trailer as many times as I can. Yep. And I get hundreds of bags. I put them in my backyard by the garden. I do shred them with my lawnmower first. Oh, uh, and good. I just pile them up and it's free food for the garden. And I mean, you know, Greg, the importance of taking care of the soil. Oh, I mean, time. when you dig in leaves or top dress with leaves in a no dig type garden, the worms go crazy. It's just fantastic for building soil. Yeah. Amen yeah. to that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So what types of gardens are we talking about in small gardens? Because that's really what we're here to talk about tonight is small space, big potential. Tell me about that. I think as long as you have a little bit of light, as you mentioned in the opener, you can grow food. And even if you don't have full sun, there's still more low light crops and herbs you can still Mm -hmm. grow as well. But I think you have to look, are you like in a, do you have any soil to plant in? Are we talking like a container situation? Are you a driveway gardener? Are you a balcony gardener? Are you on a deck or patio? So you have to look at what you have. Maybe you have space for an in-ground small garden or an herb spiral or a raised bed. So you look at what you have, you look at the light, and you pick the spot with the most light, and that's where you plant your garden. And sometimes you might have a backyard, but it's shaded. So you'll have to plant in the driveway, and you could put a couple straw bales there. You mm-hmm. could cluster some containers. You could put up some vertical planters on a fence. So look at the you know property you have, the space you have, and once you've found the spot with the most light, then you can start thinking about, okay, well, how am I going to approach this? You know, can I plant in a garden, or do I need to go to some sort of container to grow food? Wow, and you just mentioned a whole bunch of different places <laughs> to garden. I want to go to the first one, the most obvious yep. one for me that's like, a, uh, excuse me, time out. And that is a driveway gardener. If we're anywhere near a driveway here in Phoenix, most of the time our gardens cook just because <laughs> of the, the radiant heat of that. Tell me what a, yep. gar- a driveway gardener is. What's that look like? Well, you know, about 15 years ago, I had a neighbor and, you know, she wanted to grow hot peppers, really, really hot peppers, Thai peppers. Peppers that you can probably grow easily, Greg, mm-hmm. but here in Nova Scotia, I don't always have time to mature. So she put them in pots on her driveway. 
And of course the radiant heat you just mentioned helped them mature. Uh, and she added course. a whole zone to her garden, you know, next door to me here in Nova Scotia zone 5B. But you know, I have a friend in Toronto, Stephen Biggs, he has straw bales in his garden and they hold a lot more moisture than a pot would, for example. Mm -hmm. But this is a great idea for somebody in say zones three to seven. If you're in a really hot zone, maybe the driveway garden isn't for you. But, you know, in many areas, it's certainly a great way to grow food. And you can do it in containers, in straw bales, in buckets, in so many different ways. You can also buy, you know, products like veg pod or veg truck, things like that to grow in. So there's also no shortage of amazing ways to grow food. You can DIY and upcycle or you can buy something that are so readily available now from so many different companies. What's one of your favorites? I'm a raised bed girl. I think most people know that about me. I mean, I do have a veg truck and I do have a veggie pod and they, they, they perform fine. They were a lot more expensive than my raised beds, however, and I have about 30 raised beds at this point. Oh, um, nice. They're all made from, <laughs> I know they're all made from Eastern hemlock, which is a local, obviously wood here in Eastern Canada. Uh -huh. It's super rot resistant. So it lasts about 12 years for me. I make my cold frames out of it. I make my raised beds out of it. Uh, I use it for pretty much all my garden building. And it's untreated, of course, since I am yeah. an organic gardener. Well, and wow. So it lasts about 12 years and then it becomes yeah. soil, right? Eventually it certainly does. Yeah, it's very dense. Like we, I, I just built six more beds this spring and each board is so heavy. Like when you offload them from the truck or trailer, yeah. like I can't carry more than one, you know, and I think I'm pretty strong, but they're very heavy, dense boards. And that's why they last so long. But I mean, cedar is also similar. There's other types of wood you can get as well. But, you know, when you're talking raised beds for small spaces, it's a great starting point for someone. If they do have a spot for a raised bed, you can, you know, really take care and control the soil. You, know, you can grow so many different types of crops in there. They drain well. They warm up earlier, which is a bonus if you're in a cold climate like me. You don't ever walk on the soil, so it's not compacted. I have very few weeds in my raised beds, you know, and it's just it's a win-win situation. Yes, you have to invest in something to build them. You can make free-formed beds, or you could use logs or rocks or bricks or something like that uh, as yes. well, something you upcycle. But it's a great way, especially in a colder climate, to grow food. Yeah. And I've seen the logs before. That's actually really cool. Yeah. You just take old logs and build a frame out of them, and you're good to go. Yeah. The only downside I found with the logs is if the bark's still on them, those slugs are going to get under there. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. then all of a sudden, you get all these slugs hiding under that bark. So I try to strip the bark off. If I use logs, but man, they last for about four or five years, depending on the type of tree it was. It's uh -huh. Pretty good. Nice, nice. What are you doing with all of those raised beds? What are you growing and what for? Well, I mean, my third book, Veggie Garden Remix, focuses on so many different types of crops beyond your average potatoes and carrots you can grow. Mm -hmm. And that's a passion of mine, just growing unusual vegetables, pushing oh, the boundaries. Yeah, I remember that from our right? podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And I mean, with climate change, honestly, we've seen a huge difference here in the past 15 years. Warmer summers, um, longer seasons. And I can grow a lot of vegetables that I, I couldn't grow so easily, you know, 15, 20 years ago or, or as a kid when I was gardening. So I really enjoy that. So I'm growing quite a wide variety. But I grow lots of different things. But I don't grow like a glut of one type of crop because mm -hmm. people always say, how can you eat it all? But there's like there's a certain amount of beans. There's a certain amount of carrots, certain amount of potatoes. There's cucumelons. There's cucumber melons. There's peppers. But there's a little bit of everything. And of course, like you, I'm always trying new varieties and right. new crops. Yep. And some succeed. Some don't. But generally, the uh, successes outweigh the, uh, the ones that the failures. And, and that keeps me going. Yeah, I tell people that I, you know, I've killed more plants than you have. Well, maybe not you, Nikki, but most everybody uh, listening. I've Because that's part of the process, right? It's a composting opportunity. It's all it is, Greg. <laughs> I love that. That's is. great. <laughs> I've said for years that the easiest thing to grow and the most expensive thing to buy in the store are herbs. Yeah. Basil, Absolutely. oregano, dill, those kinds of things. And those could actually be grown on a sunny windowsill inside, could they not? Absolutely. I mean, you can grow herbs anywhere. Most are very easy to grow. They're low maintenance plants, you know, things like thyme and parsley. Basil is a little trickier inside. It likes to have some supplemental light. I do actually have a little LED light tucked under one of my kitchen counters mm -hmm. um, where I grow basil and rosemary oh, year round. Oh, nice. Um, otherwise, in the north where I am, there's not enough winter light to keep it alive. So I need to do that. But, you know, we have basil every day of the year. I'm even harvesting so much of it right now and freezing it for winter use. But yes, you can grow so many herbs in a windowsill, under a grow light indoors. And in winter, like in November, December, January, you probably haven't started many seeds indoors yet. Obviously, it's quite early. So I use my grow lights, which are just right over here in this basement room I'm in right now, uh -huh. to grow lots of different types of herbs and microgreens. 
and shoots and things like that as well. So, you know, you don't need an outdoor garden to grow food. You can grow plenty of things inside as well. Wow. So microgreens, what's that? <laughs> Those are just baby plants. They're vegetables, really. I mean, depending on which kind you're growing and how far you let them go. They're just like sprouts that are maybe just a week or two, you know, further along. So some things mm. like, you know, broccoli microgreens to take five to 10 days to grow or something like pea shoots might be two to three weeks, depending on the species. So mm. they're quick. They're easy. You can eat, actually buy soilless mats to grow them in, or you can just fill a tray with like an inch of potting mix and plant them right in there and put them under grow lights or in a sunny windowsill. There's dozens of varieties to try. They're packed with vitamins and nutrients. And they're really fun and easy to grow with lots of different flavors. And I find them really kid-friendly too, especially if you're growing pea shoots or sunflower shoots indoors. Ah, and why is that? Because they're delicious. And, the <laughs> and they're fun them. and they're so quick. Yeah, yeah, and they love them. So sprouts yeah. are grown in jars without soil. Microgreens are grown in soil. Microgreens are usually grown in soil, but you can actually buy little mats for them as yeah, well. You said but. Um, Yes, but you could do either. But yeah, you're right. Sprouts are just grown in jars or sprouting trays. I just use jars. You can buy screw-on sprouting tops. Mm -hmm. um, so I just do that throughout the winter months. I, I should probably start some now, but I've been so busy with the outside garden, I, I haven't even bothered starting sprouts in about two months. But they're very easy to do. Yeah. All right. So windowsill yeah. to the patio. What kind of pots? Because I know there's new cloth pots on the market. Oh, yeah. um, you know, what, what are our choices around pots and sizes? Yeah. I'm always experimenting with different types of pots. So you can upcycle items like buckets, the big white buckets. Mm -hmm. You can totally use those. You can use baskets. You can use anything that basically you can put drainage holes in, you know, to grow food. But you can also buy fabric containers, as you mentioned. You know, there's a lot of different brand names out there. And some of them are, you know, pots that are maybe like four gallons, six gallon, 10 gallon. There's big ones. I do also have some of the long beds that are fabric as well. And they're eight feet long or All six right. feet long. So mm -hmm. they're sizable. Yeah, in those, uh, in an eight foot long one, I have two in my polytunnel. I'll put 16 tomato plants or 16 cucumbers and grow them vertically in those fabric pots. So there's lots of options. And fabric pots are great. They do uh, root prune. So as the roots grow in the, the, the pot and get to the edge of the fabric pot and touch the fabric, mm -hmm. the root tip dies, but then it causes all the interior roots to kind of proliferate. Oh. And then you get this really dense root system. But it's a fabric, so it doesn't hold water as well. So you got to water it more often. So. Got it. Up yeah. and down. Just make sure whatever type of container you choose to use has drainage holes. I don't have to tell you that, Greg. I know you know the importance of good drainage <laughs> right. in a container. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So now the big question is soil. The most important, yeah. and I preach about this all the time, every opportunity I get, I preach about creating healthy soil. What kind of soil are we putting in these pots? Traditionally, we've always used potting mix. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't use garden soil. It's usually too dense and heavy. And every time you water garden soil in a pot, it gets compacted and compacted and soon there's no air left you know porous air spaces in that soil mm -hmm. um, and the roots are going to suffer and die so you need a lightweight potting mix and traditionally that's been a peat-based potting mix we're seeing more now with coconut coir mm -hmm. as well but a lot of people don't want to use either one of those two substances because you know they're they are you know great carbon sinks yeah exactly peat impactful yeah yeah so i've been experimenting with making my own with some of those leaves we talked about earlier oh yeah shred it you know, shredded leaves, compost it down, leaf mold, as well as seaweed and just different types of organic minerals and stuff. So I've been playing with that. But unfortunately, there's no great product yet that's replacing, you know, peat moss based potting mixes. Compost ones are coming along, but mm -hmm. it's not widely available. And if you do find them, they're very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> so so challenge right now. I could have sworn I heard you say seaweed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, tell me about that. Well, I live near the ocean. I'm in Nova Scotia. We're right. all pretty much near the ocean. So you can go down to the, the beach at the high tide mark and rake up and take a bunch of seaweed home with you. You know, it's, it's, it has so many plant nutrients and hormones from having to grow in such a challenging environment mm -hmm. that it's just so good for compost, so good for soil. I mean, adding liquid kelp, which you could probably buy there to your plants, yep. like your tomatoes particularly, mm -hmm. within a day or two, the plants are greener and it's just such a great way to kind of enhance their growth. But you can add seaweed to your potting mixes you can add it to your garden beds you can add it to your compost bin so if you can you can get kelp meal if you're not near the ocean or you can buy liquid kelp and both will do the same job i have to admit about 30 years ago i went over to san diego and so that's about six hours away about a six hour drive and we actually harvested bags of seaweed and brought it back <laughs> for our, our garden compost bin wow that's awesome yeah <laughs> I use rubber made bins, you know, I just put them in the trunk of the car and I just fill them up. 
<laughs> less mess. <laughs> there you go. There yeah, you it go. works great. And um, then, uh, Greg, when you fill a container with potty mix, do you also add compost or manure to it as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And worm castings? Yep. Worm castings are awesome. Worm castings yeah. are the best of the best. Yeah, they really are. Very concentrated. I just got an email today from a guy who said he's in Walla Walla, Washington, of all places. He says, I, I want to talk to you. I found your podcast. We're about ready to harvest 25,000 pounds of worm castings. Oh, my God. He said that's the most that's, that's ever been harvested at once. It's like, go, man, go. <laughs> I was we listening. have some worm farms here, too, but not that Not that, not that big, yeah. Um, no. John Knopf, do you know this uh, Regenerative Agriculture podcast? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was listening yeah. to him the other day. It's one of the podcasts I listened to. I was listening to him the other day, and he had a guest on that was making worm castings. Worm castings is worm poop and yeah. making them for specific crops. Oh, that's interesting. So they were feeding specific things to the worms so that the worms would process them for different types of crops. And it's like, wow, wow. never heard that That'd before. Be and that would be amazing if you are building some of your own potting mixes to be using some of those different types, whether it's a, a fruiting type of vegetable or a right. root vegetable or a leafy green. Yeah, that's exciting. Designer worm poop. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> right? right? Right. Hey, guys, if you're out there and you want to ask uh, Nikki a question, it's down in the Q&A down in the bottom right there. Throw your questions in there. That's for the live event. There's a question here. How do you recommend a small space gardener prioritize? Like it prioritize like they're planting put, or what to grow. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I'm always a big believer in first of all, grow what you love to eat, oh, <laughs> you know, Amen. right. And then try one or two new things. If, mm -hmm. if you've got the space, you know, put a container with something new in it. I also think if you're in a really small space, I would prioritize planting a lot of the new, newer dwarfing container and small space friendly varieties. Mm. I mean, plant breeders have been so busy the past two decades creating you know, varieties that are great for small spaces, but still produce a really good harvest. Mm -hmm. So I would maybe grow some of those bush type cucumbers or tomatoes like Tasmanian chocolate um, over say Cherokee purple, which gets seven, seven feet tall, mm -hmm. whereas Tasmanian chocolate gets three feet tall. So I would probably concentrate, concentrate on vegetables that I can control. And those are <laughs> that tomatoes. Way. Tomatoes. Yep. And I would also think about, well, what are my goals? Am I trying to save money? I mean, you know, it's been tough times for so many people the past 18 months. So, you know, if I'm trying to save money and shave money off my weekly family's, you know, grocery budget, like you said earlier, herbs are wonderful. If you use a lot of fresh herbs, I would be definitely growing those. And the next probably high value crop after herbs would be salad greens, organic salad greens, oh, yes. quick and oh, easy to grow. Yes. Very expensive. I mean, if I go to my grocery store, Greg, the salad greens come from California. Right. You know, I know. And a little plastic for five ninety nine or whatever, a little container of arugula. I can grow arugula every day of the year in my garden, mm -hmm. you know, without any heat. So I would probably think about what what I want to save money on. And so those are some things that I would probably think about. But as as I just said, like there's so many great varieties that are container friendly. So when you're looking at seed catalogs, read the descriptions carefully so you can pick out the mm -hmm. best ones for your small space. Right. Yeah, you mentioned greens. So you know, we can grow greens outside, lettuce greens, arugula, chervil, you know, all those great things yeah. we want to put in our salad from about mm, October 15th to yeah. about May 1st. Okay. So about eight years ago, I found something called a tower garden. Oh, I've, I've seen them. I haven't used one. Oh, my gosh. Very cool. I, yeah? The day I found out about them, I went out and bought one. I was that excited about them. And about four years ago, Heidi, my sweetheart, and I bought a light kit for it. Mm. So we have about six feet that way. We have a tower garden that is loaded with sour greens, salad wow. greens. Yeah. So, That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, inside, obviously, right? Inside yes, your yes, house? Yes, yes. Yeah. Inside. Yeah. Must take up a lot of space, but worth it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's a tower. So the base on it is about two feet across. And oh, okay. Yeah. And it's only about five feet tall. So that's a, yet another way to garden small is, you know, the tower gardens. They are yeah. a hydroponic based system. There's garden towers, which are the same configuration, but they have soil in them. I don't know mm. if you'd want to put that inside, but. Uh, yeah, that's cool. That's really good to know. Yeah. And I mean, that's vertical gardening. And that's another way to take advantage of small spaces. So, I mean, I know I have a pretty big vegetable garden and all that, but I'm still trying to use a lot of these small space tactics right? to grow more food. Yeah. So I've got pole bean tunnels, which are planted with 
whole beans, as well as cucumbers and edible gourds and cucumelons and things like that. You know, I, I'm using some uh, different types of vertical structures in my polytunnel to grow things up. I mean, there's lots of ways you can grow vertically on trellises and tunnels, bamboo, like tents, things like that. So you can use these in small spaces or big spaces, because when you're growing something like pole beans over bush beans, mm -hmm. if you've got the same square footage, you're going to get two to three times the harvest from the pole beans than you would from the bush beans. So you might as well go vertical and use up that uh, unused space up there. Just make sure you're not shading out nearby crops. So I usually plant vertical things on the north side of my garden. Ah, okay. Say a little bit more about that. Why? <laughs> Well, because, you know, in spring when you're planting seeds and seedlings, I mean, your garden's generally, you know, pretty empty, right? But uh -huh. those plants grow and they can shade out each other. So you want to make sure you're not planting the tall things more on the south side of your garden where they're going to shade out the shorter crops. Mm -hmm. uh, unless, you know, you're trying to grow greens in the summer when it's hot. Maybe then it's okay to have them on the bottom of your corn, uh, you know, on the north side. But generally speaking, all your crops are going to want full sun. You know, eight plus hours, if you can give it to them, 10 is even better at full sun. So you want to make sure when you position crops in a garden that they're not going to get shaded by each other. So if you've got like a, a big trellis, you know, on, on the south side of your garden, as the sun comes up, it's going to shade what's ever in front of that. Mm -hmm. So you want to be mindful about that when you're, you know, planting things in raised beds, especially when you've got 30 like I do. Right. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. How, how should we protect our little gardens from pests and weather? Yeah, well, that's the topic of my latest book, Growing Undercover. And, you know, I mean, we talked about how the climate has changed and we touched on that. You know, and one thing I've noticed, we have so many downpours. And, and this month, like July has been crazy in terms of the fact that almost every day we get a, like a downpour here. Wow. And then we in the afternoon, the sun comes out. It's very bizarre. But those heavy downpours of rain, which normally would get a day or two of rain, maybe every couple of weeks, and everything would be nicely watered. Now it's these heavy downpours and it crushes plants down. It damages them. And of course, it invites disease uh, as well. And when plants are stressed out, it also invites pests. So it can be very detrimental to a garden, especially this time of the year when everything's starting to ripen and you're getting excited about all those tomatoes and everything. So, you know, as, as, with the rain, there's not too much you can do. But you do want to, of course, you could use row covers if you're going to be getting hail or downpours and thunderstorms, things like that. But for pests, early on, for example, when I first plant my cucumbers or my squash plants, I will use lightweight insect barrier fabrics or row covers to prevent any pests that may have overwintered in my garden from coming, coming up and up munching on my little tiny plants, yeah. right? Yeah. And when your plants are really small, just little seedlings, they're very susceptible to pest damage. If they're bigger, well, they can probably withstand a few cucumber beetles or some slugs. But when they're small, it's, it's much different. So I do use a lot of row covers and insect barrier fabrics and, and different devices like that in my garden. I use mini hoop tunnels, you know, to capture heat, especially early in the season. And then again, later in the season too. So there's many different types of products you can buy. I've heard from a lot of people that there's been a shortage with the pandemic of certain types of fabrics and things like that for gardens. But mm -hmm. I think they're starting to get stock again now that shipping has kind of resumed uh, right. its normal course here in North America. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. And, and now that, you know, now that you brought it up, I, I've said for years that we have about a three day supply of food in any grocery store. And yeah. we actually, in the That's past year fair. and a half, we've seen that twice in spades. The massive and toilet paper and toilet and, and toilet, toilet paper, paper. <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> So right. that, oh that's, re that's really the reason that we, that we need to be understanding how to grow our own food. Yeah, know? I mean, it, I mean, it's definitely something I think more people, you know, there's been a boom, huge gardening boom. There's been a oh. boom in greenhouses, yep. boom in cold frames, boom in so many different ways in the gardening seeds. industry. Seeds. Oh my gosh. Trying to get seeds last year was very tricky. I'm glad I ordered in January before right? everything yeah. hit the fan. But yeah, and then of course all my excess seeds I've been sharing like crazy with people so that they can have access to, to the seeds that I have as well. So, and then I'm seed saving. That's another sort of aspect people are doing too. So, Amen. you know, they're learning how to grow food. They're learning how to save seeds. And I think it's really driven home how important those skills are. You know, they're not just yes. things that our grandparents did, but they're things that we can do too. And, you know, so many of my neighbors have put in one or two raised beds. My sister, my oldest sister, finally put her first raised bed in this year. <laughs> nice. And I'm like... Finally, right? But um, she still shops in my garden, but at least she's got her own little one coming along. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So Wendy wants to know, do you rinse off the seaweed after harvesting it prior to using it, questioning the salt content? That's an excellent question. Yeah, yeah I get asked that one a lot. If it, You can't take seaweed from the rock. So the seaweed we're harvesting is seaweed that's already washed up. 
And chances are that once we grabbed it, it's been in probably five or six rainstorms already. So when I first started using seaweed, you know, a couple decades ago, I would hose it off, but I don't even bother now if I'm using it to top my beds as a mulch or around the potatoes or something, because mm -hmm. slugs won't crawl across seaweed because it's too salty, but it doesn't really add uh... salt content to the soil. So unless it was really, really freshly washed up, I don't. I just pile it right on the compost or, or right on my beds and it's fine. Nice. And the, the, the sea salt has minerals in it for the plants anyway, right? Yeah, and I, like I said, yeah, seaweed is packed with plant hormones, growth hormones, as well as a lot of micronutrients, ones you don't often find in other types of fertilizers. So it's pretty amazing stuff for the garden. Like, you know, I like to base in science, not garden lore. And uh, seaweed has definitely been proven to be a very effective garden fertilizer and soil conditioner. Yeah. Yeah. Amen to that. Shirley wants to know <laughs> how much worm castings do you mix in your potting soil containers? Usually it'll stay on the bag <laughs> or the package you've got. But generally speaking, I mean, it depends on the soil container too. I mean, if I've got a container that's say 12 inches across and 12 inches deep, you know, I'd probably put half a cup of worm castings in there. Generally, when I'm filling a container with potting mix, I will do two thirds potting mix and one third aged manure or compost mm -hmm. and then kind of mix it all together. And then I often add a slow release organic vegetable fertilizer too. And that kind of sets it up nicely. You know, again, I'm experimenting with different types of soil amendments in my containers to build potting soils that are more environmentally friendly mm -hmm. but the jury's still out yet on what's going to be effective but right. do stay tuned <laughs> we actually have a really interesting additive here in the desert southwest we have a mill a saw mill that has 50 years of saw saw mill tailings yeah. that have been sitting wow 50 years 50 years they have huge piles of this stuff so we've been harvesting it Around the state, we've been harvesting it, and that's a big part of our local planting mix. Wow, that'd be yeah. pretty rich. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah, it is It is really, really nice, and there's like uh, 0.5 nitrogen in it, so there's actually some nitrogen built into it already. So Very cool. Um, yeah, that'd be a great base. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Alan and Lori would like to know if sand in the potting mix is a good idea. I never add sand. unless uh, The only time I'd add sand to a potting mix, is if I'm growing cacti or other types mm, of succulents that want a right. better draining soil, but I don't do that for any types of vegetables. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another thing to buy. And you know what? I don't want to spend more money if I don't have to. Yeah. So I'm going to keep it simple. Yeah. I tell people for that, sure. you know, don't buy dirt because that's what, <laughs> what, that's what we have here in the desert. People have dirt. It's less than a half a percent organic matter. Wow. So when you're buying a planting mix or a garden bed mix, don't buy the stuff that has dirt in it already. You got plenty of dirt. <laughs> yeah go compost rich you know as best you can and save those leaves do bill and dahlia want to know do weeds collected from the lake act the same as seaweed that's a curious question that's a good question i don't have any idea honestly i would think the reason seaweed is so effective in terms of its plant hormones and micronutrients and such partly because of the salt water but also partly because it gets nibbled by so many types of you know fish and barnacles and different types of things that it grows quickly you know, seaweed can put on half an inch or an inch a day, depending on the type of seaweed it mm -hmm. is. I'm not I, I imagine lake plants would also grow pretty quickly. So maybe they do have more plant hormones than your average, you know, composted leaves, for example. But I don't know. That's a really good question. Yeah. Now I want to know. <laughs> I, and I'd be I'd yeah. be cognizant of what else might be in the lake water. Yeah, Just, that's true. Runoff, things like that. Yeah. So this is from Ann and Wendy. Two different questions, same question. Can I reuse the soil in my containers if the plants were healthy? And Wendy says, regarding potting mix or soil, when repotting, do you reuse the soil or augment it? Yeah, okay. Well, the old, the old potting mix, my good friend Jessica Wallace, who I know has been on your show, she is a container garden expert, and she gets asked this all the time. And I'm going to go with her answer. You should ideally change the potting mix in your containers every year. If you got a big container like a veggie pot or a veg truck, I would probably swap out half of it as well as adding lots of compost. What I do with my own containers, if I'm getting rid of the potting mix, is I have this big area at the back of my garden bed. And that's where I pile up the half-rotted straw bales from the previous year from straw bale garden. Yep. And so I just layer the old potting mix, the straw bales, maybe some organic fertilizer. And then in that weird little mix, I just pop in some squash, pumpkin, cucumber, gourd babies, mm -hmm. and let them take over that whole back part of the garden. So I, I kind of make a free-formed bed with my old potting mix, and it works great. And then by the end of the season, it's broken down so much that the next year, I just pile right on top of it again. And now if I'm repotting a pot, I will refresh the potting soil, 
but I don't wash the roots if it's healthy and such and, and then clean them off and replace the potting soil completely. I'll just kind of augment it. And then if you have like indoor house plants, or even if you're growing something like ginger or other type of edible indoor plants, tropical plants, I often use like a chopstick or a pencil and I'll, I'll poke holes in the potting mix oh, if it's like kind of old and crusty yeah. and I'll kind of put a little fresh potting soil down there and around the outside when I repot. And that just adds air to those sort of <laughs> crusty old potting mix parts and some fresh soil nutrients. And it, it's amazing how quickly they respond to that, honestly. <laughs> yeah, right. And yeah. you can always add worm castings. Top it with like, you know, a quarter inch of worm castings yeah. out every two to three months. Garden magic. Yeah. And also wanted to know if there was a disease in the pot, powdery mildew or disease, do you want to reuse it? Yeah, I would, I would use the pot. You know, powdery mildew usually comes from the growing conditions like heat, humidity. This is the time of year here we're starting to see powdery mildew and it's been so humid. So, you know, I mean, if I see powdery mildew on my plants now, I'll just clip off affected leaves. I usually spray a milk solution, you know, which I've found to be really effective the past five years, but one part skim milk, nine parts water. I mix it up and I spray it every 10 to 12 days, but it's rained every day. Like I said, Greg, oh, yeah. so it hasn't been helping me that much. I got to tell you, there's no point. But if I had disease plants in a container, I would definitely uh, dump that potting mix. And then, I mean, if it was powdery mildew, I'd still add that to my preformed pile for my squash and pumpkin plants. Yep. But I would also wash the container well, just soapy water uh, and rinse it well before I refilled it. Thanks for that. <laughs> Chikay wants to know, I try to save seeds, but when I wait for uh, the vegetables to seed, I lose precious space. Um, yeah. Any ideas on how to save seeds and not lose the space? Yes. What I do, and I do save seeds from some of my open pollinated and heirloom crops, is I only let one or two plants go to seed. I mean, if you've got a lettuce plant, you know, like rows of lettuce, and you've been eating from them and all that, now they've bolted, mm -hmm. pull them all out except for one uh, or one arugula plant. Each one of those, or a kale plant, they're going to give you about 500 seeds. How many lettuce seeds do you need, right? One plant, leaving just that one, will give you lots of seeds, but then still free up the rest of that row or that garden bed for new crops. So just don't leave too, too many, uh, and you'll be fine. I swear, like, I don't know, Greg, if you're like this, but I have a lot of flowers and vegetables that reseed in my garden. And when they come up in Big spring, time. I'm so happy to see them. Yep. I don't clean them out as well as I should because I feel guilty. And then, of course, midsummer, you've got this crazy jungle. So I'm trying to be better about pulling out extra plants I don't need. Or sharing them with friends in spring, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can cool. get a lot quick. All right, so Cynthia, excuse me, Cynthia wants to know, and I have an interesting thing that I learned about this recently, but Cynthia wants to know any tips on controlling aphids? Oh, aphids, yeah. I mean, <laughs> they're the most common garden pests out there, really. You know, uh, one thing I do in my garden beds, in many of my raised beds, if you've seen my Instagram, you probably know this, is that I use nasturtiums as a trap crop. So I have nasturtiums oh, yeah. planted at the edges of my raised beds. And invariably, a couple of the plants get aphids on them. Well, that's okay. I leave them because there's also lots of ladybugs and lacewings that will then feast on those aphids. But then the aphids never quite make it to my pepper plants. You know, they don't get all the way in the garden bed. They, they pretty much stop at the nasturtiums because they're happy with them. So, so trap cropping, I find, works well. But if I see aphids on something else, like I did have aphids in my peppers earlier in the season, I waited a day or two. You know, I just, I saw them, they were there. You know, I, I didn't see much damage happening. And I waited. Two days later, I saw three ladybugs on one of the clusters. So I'm yes. like, okay, well, I, I'm not touching that because they'll do the job for me. Yeah. Now, if I waited those couple days and I didn't see anything happening with beneficial insects, I would probably use my hose and just knock them off. Because once an aphid falls to the ground, it can't climb back up. Right. You know, a ground beetle is going to come eat it or something. So just use a hard jet of water to knock it off. Like here in Nova Scotia, we're an organic province anyway. So... We don't use any chemicals in the vegetable garden. It's all organic, and it's been that way since, I think, 2001, I think it's been. So oh, it's been nice. 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So yeah. I had Christy Wilhelmy recently on my podcast, on the podcast. Big uh, fan. Gardener, <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. She tells me about something called chitin. Chitin is in bug's skin, their outer shell, and chitinase is in worm castings. Okay. And so when the sucking bugs show up on her on her plants, she treats them with a bunch of worm castings. That yeah. chitinase goes up in the plants and it negatively impacts the the sucking bugs, aphids and white flies. Mm. It negatively impacts their shell, so they either die or they go away. And I thought this is why I do my podcast so I can learn <laughs> cool things like that. 
That's pretty mind blowing. I have her new book actually, which I've only just started. Uh-huh. So I'm going to have to read it, see if that's in it. more details, not see if there's some scientific studies out on that. That sounds like another great reason to get worm casting. Amen. Wow. That's awesome. Rose wants to know what grew, what would grow good in a windowsill? Well, it depends which way it's facing <laughs> and how much light it gets, right? Mm-hmm. If you've got a bright, sunny windowsill, that might be too bright for many plants. And it depends where you are as well, how high in the hemisphere, your latitude you know, in my window still right now, I have a lot of, I like low care indoor plants. So mm-hmm. I have a lot of jade plants and succulents and things like that in my window still. But if you want a food plant, I mean, it's really easy to grow oregano inside. Parsley indoors is great. And I would stick to curly because it doesn't get as big as Italian parsley. All right. Thyme, right? <laughs> Thyme is a great one to grow indoors. You know, any of those types of herbs. Basil would be fine now where there's lots of light. But in winter, if you're north like me, then it would be more of a challenge. Rosemary. So there's lots of herbs. And you could also grow, you know, salad greens. You know, again, it just depends where you are, how much light you have, what kind of yeah. south-facing, north-facing window. But there's lots and lots of different kinds of plants, food plants or ornamentals you can grow in the windowsill. Cool. So I got two more questions for you, and then we're going to talk about your books and website because I don't want to skip that because you, what you're doing is absolutely amazing. Jeremy wants to know, and I'm going to just read this exactly the way he wrote it. All right. Um, Hello, is it better to pack in lots of plants to maximize space or is it better to plant, space the plants out to maximize the amount of light that hits each leaf? Mm, that's a good question. Really good question. The answer is yes. <laughs> it depends. Um, yeah, it totally depends. So, well, yes and no. So I practice intensive planting in my raised beds. It's one of the benefits of having raised beds. You can plant a lot of vegetables in them, but I don't crowd them. So, you know, I, I will put a lot of things in there. I often plant in a grid pattern giving things enough space, they'll get lots of light, but also so that I, I, my goal is so that when the plants are to the stage, I want to harvest them, which is usually for most vegetables, just below maturity. So lettuce, for example, you want to harvest slightly immature. So if I'm growing heads of lettuce, you know, I know they're going to get 10 inches across. So I'm going to try to space my plants out. So they're when they're at that part, I want to harvest them. They're about, you know, touching, just touching. They're not squishing each other. They're not overlapping. So all that information is in the seed packet. And you can use that to figure out how closely or how far apart to space things because you want the leaves to pretty much touch so they create a living mulch over the soil. That'll reduce weeds. It'll help hold soil moisture too, of course. But everything is different. Like I can't even tell you a specific lettuce variety because some, you know, grow four or five inches across and some grow 15 inches across. So it's going to depend on lettuce, the beans, et cetera. So I do, I don't crowd my plants, but I do plant them very intensively. So if you looked at my garden beds right now, you're not going to see any soil visible, mm-hmm. but you know, you're not going to see every plant tangled up as well. Yeah. Happens sometimes, but I try to uh, generally plant them so that doesn't happen. Well, especially in the wild places. Exactly. With the plants <laughs> that we don't want to pull out. Shelly yep. wants to know, could you tell me how to get rid of Japanese beetles? Oh, yeah. You know, I, she's going to hate me for this, but we don't really have one. <laughs> There's only a few pockets in Nova Scotia where they are. And of course, they've come in on plants that have been imported. I've seen one in my garden ever three years ago, I think. Mm-hmm. So hand picking, honestly, is probably the best way to get rid of them. Yeah. Bucket of soapy water, a little dose of vegetable oil in there as well. And just hand pick them into that. I find that really would be the most effective way to do it. You know, you can get traps, of course, with uh, lures and stuff to bring them in. The problem with that is research has shown us that it's bringing them in from your neighbors <laughs> and oh. down the block and the road as well. And you don't want to attract them to your garden. So I would stick with hand picking if you can. Not the greatest answer, but unfortunately, that is probably going to be the most effective thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. <laughs> you have some amazing books. And, you know, yeah. just in Thank our you. two conver- well, in our two conversations, you know, I, I, let, let me step back here. I get to talk to a lot of people. You know, we've done over 650 episodes in the Urban Farm Podcast. And yeah. you're one of the people that I look up to, you yeah. and Christy, for the, for the scientific data that you present your stuff with you know what what you've thought it through really well so thank you for that and with that said tell me about your new book growing undercover yeah i'm a bit of a science nerd love it (laughs) and growing undercover is the result of 20 years of experimentation in my backyard Mm -hmm. you know so it basically tells you and gives you strategies for growing more food with fewer pests and a more weather resistant garden i mean i deal with deer groundhogs rabbits squirrels chipmunks aphids, cabbage worms, slugs, so many different types of pests. Mm -hmm. And my garden covers have really allowed me to still grow a great bounty of food while dealing with all those pests, as well as the new downpours that we now have. 
-hmm. and the short season that I have. So there's a lot of ways you can use garden covers, whether it's a row cover or a mini hoop tunnel or cold frame, you know, or leaves <laughs> or even a poly tunnel or greenhouse to grow more food and to grow better. So that's what the whole book is about. If you want to grow tomatoes, like we're having a greenhouse boom right now in North America, small DIY greenhouses, people put poly tunnels, geodesic domes in their yards. So exciting. So if you have one of those and you want to know how to grow tomatoes vertically, I will tell you. If you want to know how to pinch your pepper plants to get double the harvest, it's in that book. So there's lots of information on, you know, not only what type of covers, but then how to use them to just be more productive. Nice. And the year round vegetable gardener. Yeah. That was my first book. And again, when I wrote it, I didn't think anybody would really care about my crazy cold frames and all the things I do. So that one focuses more on how to really extend the season all year long, no matter where you live. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where it's growing undercover focuses on sort of more weather resistant, pest resistant strategies and, and then walk in structures. I don't talk about walk in structures in the year round vegetable gardener, but yeah, that book is, I mean, it also goes into great detail. If you want to grow carrots, for example, I've got like six pages on how to grow carrots, you know, all the different times of the year, when you can plant them based on your frost dates. So there's a lot of information there. It was a lot of research, but it was a lot of fun to write them. Nice, uh, nice, nice books. <laughs> and SavvyGardening.com, that's a cool story. Tell us about that. Well, I mean, I have two partners on that website. We get about 2 million visitors a month. So it's Jessica Wallister, who's... <laughs> Yeah. It's Jessica Wallister, who's the award-winning author, two-time winner of the American Horticultural Society Book Award. Her new book, Plant Partners, she and I, as well as Tara Nolan, a best-selling author from Toronto, we own that website, and we just share science-based gardening stuff in a fun way. I'm mostly food gardening on there. I just wrote an article today for it, and how do you know when to pick your tomatoes? Chances are, you know, it's not when they're fully ripe. So I just wrote about that, ah. um, but we write lots of interesting food, ornamental, mm -hmm. trees, shrubs, everything. Yeah, so it's all a lot right. of fun, and I have the best business partners. Right, and they've all you, all three of you have been on the podcast. Thank yeah. you very much. I love that. <laughs> and how do we know when to pick a tomato? <laughs> well, I pick my tomatoes when they're about three quarters ripe, but you mm. can pick them anytime they're past the breaker stage. That's the stage when they're showing up to ten percent of color. If you pick it when it's just starting to pink or red up, or if it's yellow, yellow up, it's still going to fully ripe for you. But a fully ripe tomato, as you know, Greg, is very tempting to the chipmunks, the squirrels, the deer, the rabbits, the groundhog, <laughs> the birds. The birds, um, yeah. Whereas, right, as well as disease and splitting if you get a rainstorm, for example. So it's better to pick them before they're fully ripe. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Garden Chat today. Do you have any last thoughts that you want to share? I just want to say thank you, you and Janice. I mean, this has been so much fun. I appreciate you guys having me on. It's Always so great to chat, and I love listening to the podcast when I'm out in my runs or in the garden. Oh, in my nice, ears. <laughs> nice. So thank you. Savvygardening.com. Did I get that right? You did, yeah. And, of course, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook as Nikki Jabor. Say that again because I just over-talked you. Oh, no, I don't. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter as Nikki Jabor. Perfect. And, you know, in your bio, it says you do a weekly radio show, and we didn't talk about that. Is that a local radio show up there or – yeah, it broadcasts across uh, Nova Scotia as well as uh, in Ontario, the province of Ontario. And then it broadcasts online at the same time live on the website for the radio station. So we have listeners every week from Chicago, Louisville, Boston, you know, BC, all across North America and even wow. in the UK who tune in. And we've been doing it for, I've been doing it for 14 years. So it's, wow. time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, no kidding. Right? right. <laughs> hey. It does. I'd love to be your guest. Hint, hint. <gasps> awesome. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to email you, Greg. That'd right, be perfect. perfect. I would love it. Perfect. Perfect. So I got two more things to just wrap up here real quick. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, our next few classes on August 31st, we have Permaculture in Your Garden with Kari Spencer. Oh, this is cool. Planting in the Right Season on September 28th for the garden chat with Christy Wilhelmy and right. And then uh, in October we have our own Raymond Jess talking about thinking outside the garden box with wicking beds. He's going to be talking oh. about wicking beds. So yeah. Cool. So, Super small spaces. Right. Thanks for the team. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Nikki. Thank this you. This has been an absolute delight. I, uh, <laughs> I so appreciate connecting with you and it, it up levels my thinking, which is really cool. Oh, thank you. So great to see you again. Thanks, right, Greg. Right back at you. And thank you all of our listeners out there that have been uh, diligently listening, especially the last 18 months with uh, COVID here. So We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. 
You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.